Okay, previously we talked about positron emission tomography, or PET scanning. It's a kind of hemodynamic imaging technique. That is, it measures changes in blood flow locally in different parts of the brain while you're doing something. And it can figure out what parts of the brain are doing what, because that change in blood flow, in this case blood volume, is tied to brain activity. As neurons become more active, they increase the diameter of blood vessels that are nearby and cause more blood to flow to that region. Functional MRI works in a, a pretty similar way, but instead of measuring blood volume, it really measures changes in the level of blood oxygenation, as we're going to see. And it provides a lot of advantages over positron emission tomography. Let's talk a little bit about the physics of how it works. I'm going to go into the details in a bit more uh, detail than you'll really need, <coughs> but I think it's really interesting, and I, I think you will too. So you take the subject, the person that you're scanning, using functional MRI, and you place them in a strong homogeneous magnetic field. This aligns the hydrogen atoms, which are actually protons, with that strong magnetic field. It turns out individual um, protons, individual subatomic particles really, have something called spin, a property called spin. Now you'd have to talk to a, a nuclear physicist about exactly what this is, but you can conceptualize it as being kind of like a spinning top. It has an axis around which it spins. And that axis, normally, is pointed in all sorts of random directions, as you can see here in the normal state. So the axes of these protons are pointing in lots of different directions. When we put the person in a very strong magnetic field, however, like the one that's created by the MRI machine, those axes line up. So now that you can see the axes of the protons are all lined up with that strong magnetic field. But they're not just sitting still, like a top, a uh, spinning top, it can, can kind of precess, it kind of wobbles, this axis. That wobbling is, uh, there's a, a formula that tells us how fast it's going to wobble based on the strength of the magnetic field that it's put in. It's called the Larmor frequency. We can use that to send in radio waves, which are really just electromagnetic waves at, a same, at the same frequency as these protons are wobbling. What happens is, is that the, they start to oscillate away from the magnetic field, so they, they're sort of pointing in this direction now, and they're spinning now in phase with one another. Then the MRI machine listens for an echo. So just as those radio waves were sent in and caused these little magnetic fields to, uh, to oscillate in synchrony with one another, they can emit a radio frequency echo, which is picked up by the same antenna that was used to make the radio waves. It turns out that the rate at which these things dephase, the way they, the rate at which they go out of phase, is dependent on the, the local magnetic field, which in turn is dependent upon the, uh, the amount of hemoglobin in the blood. So you probably know that hemoglobin is a molecule that allows your blood to carry oxygen. There are two different forms of it oxyhemoglobin, with oxygen bound to the, the hemoglobin molecule, and deoxyhemoglobin, where it's not bound. And we find this in the red blood cells of your, uh, your blood. More deoxyhemoglobin makes those protons dephase faster, which results in a smaller radio frequency echo from that part of the brain. Conversely, if you increase the amount of oxygenated hemoglobin, then you get a bigger signal from that part of the brain, a bigger echo. And when we create images from this, that shows up as a brighter spot on that image. Paradoxically, increasing the amount of activity in the brain, the number of action potentials and postsynaptic activity, actually increases the amount of oxygenated hemoglobin. It's as if the blood vessels overcompensate in that part of the brain. They open up and let more blood in, more oxygenated blood, than those cells actually need. So you end up with more oxyhemoglobin in the parts of the brain that are most active. So you end up with a brighter signal because the, it's the deoxyhemoglobin that's causing the smaller signal. It's causing the, uh, the protons to dephase. When more of them are in phase, they make a bigger echo and a bigger signal from that part of the brain. This effect is known as the BOLD effect, blood oxygen level dependent imaging, and it's the basis for pretty much all functional MRI studies. Let me show this to you more graphically. <clears throat>
So imagine that this is a blood vessel in your brain, a little capillary. And imagine these little ovals are hemoglobin molecules. The red ones are oxygenated hemoglobin, and the blue ones are deoxygenated hemoglobin without oxygen bound to it. And you can see the deoxygenated blood has these circles around it, indicating that they're perturbing the local magnetic field. As a result, they're causing those uh, protons to dephase faster and reducing the amount of signal bouncing back from this part of the brain. When a part of the brain is active, though, you can see that there are relatively more oxygenated hemoglobin molecules in the blood vessel and ultimately in that part of the brain. So you've got relatively less, proportionally less, deoxyhemoglobin. That means that you get less dephasing of the protons and a bigger signal from that part of the brain. The resulting images look something like this. We take a series of slices of the brain to cover the whole brain in about a, about a second and a half. We'll take sort of a picture of activity in the whole brain every second and a half or so, depending on how you do it. And it looks like this. It's not super high resolution, but it's not too bad. This is a, a horizontal or axial slice through the brain. And you can see that some parts are darker and some parts are brighter. There are different reasons for that. But what's most important is that the relative brightness in each part of the brain will change with how much oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin is there. So for example, uh, the data in this study here were acquired from a subject who was either seeing stationary dots, just dots sitting there, or moving dots, or nothing at all. So you can see for the first 40 seconds, the subject saw nothing at all, then they saw moving dots, then nothing, then stationary dots, then nothing, and so forth. This part of the brain here is primary visual cortex, area V1. This is the first part of cortex that gets input from the eyes. And you can see that its activity increases pretty dramatically whenever you're seeing something. It's a little bit bigger when you're seeing the moving dots compared to the stationary dots, but not that much bigger. Really, these cells just like to see things. They're activated by objects in the visual field. Compare that, though, with area MT, right about here. This part of the brain is known to be important for processing movement, for analyzing motion in the visual field. And you can see here that when the subject is seeing moving dots, you see a dramatic increase in the signal coming from that part of the brain. When you're not doing anything, you don't see anything. But look at the static dots. The static dots are producing almost no activity there. The neurons in this part of the brain just aren't responding to stationary dots. But they are responding really dramatically to moving dots. In fact, in animals, we can stick an electrode, a microelectrode, into this part of the brain and show that individual neurons there represent specific directions of movement from a particular part of the visual field. And we'll talk more about this part of the brain when we get to the vision chapter. So this is nice, but you, you really need to know where in the brain you're looking beforehand in order to go and probe that part of the brain this way. Normally when people do functional MRI studies, they'll take a whole series of these uh, images throughout the whole brain for many minutes, sometimes even a half an hour or more at a time, while the subject is doing different things or experiencing different things, like moving and stationary dots. But if you don't know ahead of time what part of the brain you expect to be active, what you can do is go and probe each and every little pixel, each and every spot in the brain, and do a statistical test. Those of you who've taken statistics will be familiar with a t-test. And many times we'll do uh, voxel by voxel. A voxel is a three-dimensional pixel. We'll do voxel by voxel tests for statistically significant differences in the signal coming from each little part of the brain between different conditions. For example, the, the stationary versus moving dots uh, experiment that I just described. And the end result is a statistical map. So just like when you do a statistical test, the result will either be statistically significant or not you can map out which of those little pixels, which spots in the brain, had a statistically significant difference between the two conditions that you're interested in. Here's an example. So these are some data I collected when I was in, in graduate school. In this study, it was a pretty simple experiment. The subjects were either seeing visual stimuli in the left visual field, on the left side of where they were looking, or in the right visual field. 
And then I did a t-test, a voxel by voxel, spot by spot t-test to see which parts of the brain had significantly different activity, significantly different amounts of signal between these two different conditions, left field versus right field stimulation. And you can see the map here. So red and blue are showing uh, statistically significant changes in activity between these two conditions. And of course they're going in different directions. So the negative is going to be a, a negative difference and the positive is a positive difference mathematically. And you see exactly what you would see. So left visual stimulation activates the right visual cortex way in the back of the brain. Right visual field stimulation activates primarily visual cortex in the left occipital lobe and parts of the parietal and temporal lobe as well. In this study though we were looking for something else. We were actually looking for the lateral geniculate nucleus and you can see it right here. The head was a little tilted so it's showing up on two different slices but this is the LGN or lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus which you will learn later is important for relaying visual signals from the eye up to the cortex. This is a part of the thalamus here. So now we have these statistical maps for each slice within the brain, and we can see which parts of the brain were significantly different in their activity levels between two or more conditions. Unfortunately, though, the areas of the brain that are active between two conditions can vary pretty dramatically from one person to another. This is showing you two functionally defined areas of the brain. Uh, this is, again, from some data I collected when I was in graduate school for my dissertation. This is an area called MT. This is that motion selective area of the brain. And you can see its location is pretty consistent across subjects. Each one of these rows is a different person's brain. This area, though, V4, is color sensitive. So we localize this by showing colored images versus black and white images. And you can see that its location varies pretty dramatically from one subject to the next. Some of them don't have it on one side of the brain. So it becomes difficult then to do group level statistics because when you collapse or average across individuals then you you lose your understanding of these individual differences in their functional anatomy. But nonetheless that's usually how this research is done. What we'll do is take each individual subject's brain and after collecting some really high resolution structural images like this. You can see this is a series of coronal images, coronal slices going from the back of the brain to the front. We'll put these together into a three-dimensional volume inside the computer and then we'll align everyone's brain within a standard space. We're squeezing it into the same size box with the same subcortical structures aligned. And then you can do group level statistical tests. And you end up with maps like this. What's shown in blue, for example, down here, these are parts of the brain that were active when people were paying attention to moving stimuli, or getting ready to pay attention to movement. The areas colored in red are parts of the brain that were active when people were paying attention for color. Now, importantly, these results went against the popular view at the time, which was that the same areas of the brain were important for directing attention to anything, whatever it is that you're attending to. It was thought that there was this one sort of dorsal network, mainly the ones shown, the areas shown in blue here, that did that for everything. These results suggest that that's really not the case, that attending to different kinds of things activates different parts of the, this network. This three-dimensional cortex here that you're seeing is actually the cortex of a friend of mine, and I used a structural image like this and then use some software to segment out the cortex, really the cortical and white matter boundary, and then create this 3D model of the shape of the cortex. After you do that, then you can overlay your statistical maps onto that and produce images like this, which can be really helpful for visualizing the three-dimensional structure of your data. You can also compare across groups. So in this particular study, they had subjects read Braille. So they were people who could see but could also read Braille and people who are blind from an early age who could read Braille. And they had these two groups of people read Braille or not. You always have to have a control condition. Um, while they were being scanned using functional MRI. <clears throat> and here is a little coronal slice through the mostly through the occipital lobe. 
and you can see this massive amount of activation in what would be visual cortex, the visual part of the brain, in people who are blind from an early age, either birth or the first couple of years of life. So these pe people essentially never saw. But the part of the brain that would normally be devoted to vision, you can see, is highly active when they're reading Braille. This highlights how plastic the brain is. It highlights a function of the brain called neuroplasticity. That's its ability to reorganize itself, which is very dramatic when you're very young. The brain has a, a very high level of plasticity at young ages. This would not be the case for someone who learned to read Braille after going blind at a late age, as an adult, for an example. Okay, so let's compare functional MRI with PET. It has some, some serious advantages over PET. One, there's no radiation, so you can do it as many times as you want, uh, and there's really very little, if any, risk. It has better spatial resolution, the ability to know where brain activity changed. You can get down to about a millimeter or two, knowing where in the brain activity changed. And it has much better temporal resolution, knowing in time when activity changed. You can get down to about half a second or so, knowing when brain activity changed. And you can repeat conditions many times within a subject. As a result, you can get individual difference studies comparing one person to the next, which isn't really possible with PET. And in addition to the functional data, the, the patterns of brain activity, you also can collect at the same time from the same subjects high-resolution anatomical images, images that really precisely show you the, um, the structure of the brain. And then you can overlay those, uh, those functional data, the statistical maps, onto these high-resolution images. But there are some drawbacks. If you've ever had an MRI, you know that it's very, very loud, very noisy. So it can make uh, studies of, of auditory processing, of hearing, very, uh, very challenging. In those cases, oftentimes, people will still use PET. This is showing you uh, an MRI scanner, a typical MRI scanner. Inside here is a huge electromagnet, miles and miles of copper wire that are charged up with current to create a magnetic field up to 10,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. You have to be very careful as you approach the magnet that you don't have any metal on your body because it'll fly into the bore of the magnet right here where the subject normally goes. And then you have to have a way to show images and present sounds to the subject. That's what this little device here is. Here's the control room. Here's where you prescribe the slices. So you can see a little mid-sagittal section through a brain. And then what looks like a gray box around it is actually a series of individual slices. So you're specifying to the machine where you want the slices to go in order, in this case, to cover the whole brain effectively. What are some drawbacks for fMRI, though? Generally, it has pretty poor temporal resolution, especially when you compare it with ERPs, which had very, very high temporal resolution, down to a ten-thousandth of a second, really, if you wanted to. Even with functional MRI, oxygen changes don't occur until several seconds after the brain activity changes. But if you're very careful about it, sometimes you can actually combine functional MRI data and its high resolution, high spatial resolution, with ERP data, event-related potential data, and its high temporal resolution. But I can tell you from experience that it's very difficult to do this. Okay, now let's compare here MRI versus fMRI, structural or anatomical imaging techniques with functional imaging techniques. So with MRI and with CAT, MRI just stands for magnetic resonance imaging and CAT for computerized axial tomography, also called a CT scan, computerized tomographic imaging. With these methods, you can obtain images about brain structure. If you wanted to answer a question about how someone's hippocampus varied in size, let's say between people with PTSD and people without PTSD, you would go and you would look at the size of the hippocampus using MRI or maybe CAT, but probably MRI because it has better resolution than a CAT scan. So these are best used for answering questions about the structure of the brain. So they image brain structure. Functional MRI, on the other hand, as the name implies, is about looking at brain function, looking at what different parts of the brain do. Uh, PET also is a functional imaging technique. Both of these rely on changes in blood throughout the brain, which is correlated with brain activity. So functional MRI and PET image brain function, trying to map out which parts of the brain do what. 
this is kind of a nice slide to sum things up. What we've done here uh, is plot out the temporal resolution of different brain imaging techniques and the spatial resolution of different brain imaging techniques. Let's start with single unit recordings. So this is single cell or single neuron recordings, which we talked about, where you take a microelectrode and you snug it up against an individual neuron, usually in an animal's brain, and you can record action potentials happening in that neuron as the animal is doing things and relate the function of that neuron to what the animal is doing or seeing or experiencing. You can see that the, the spatial resolution is very high. You can get down to the level of the individual neuron. And the temporal resolution is very good as well. You can know when the activity of that neuron changed down to less than a millisecond. And you can leave these implanted for days or weeks or months at a time. And so you can look at changes over long periods of time as well. So it seems like a really great tool, but of course it has drawbacks. First, they won't let me do it in humans. Uh, it's not really ethical to be poking electrodes into people's brains just because you want to. Second, though, it has a very, very small window. You're looking at the activity of just one neuron out of billions within the animal's brain. So it's giving you a relatively small window into what's going on in the brain at any given moment. Now let's look at ERPs right here, event-related potentials. Look at the spatial resolution. Not that great. You know it's in the brain, uh, and you can generally get down to a lobe sometimes, but generally not down to the level of a cortical map, which we'll talk about later, what cortical maps are. The temporal resolution, though, is excellent. You can get down to a millisecond or less knowing when brain activity changed. It's just hard to know where. With functional MRI, the spatial resolution is better. If you look on the y-axis here, you can get down to the level of a map. And actually, since this graph has been made, people have been able to image cortical columns, which are just a millimeter or so wide. Uh, so that's pretty good, pretty good spatial resolution. But there can be millions of neurons in a chunk of brain that big. So what we'd like to do, really, is get down to individual neuron level, or maybe even the level of individual dendrites and synapses, if we could. But let's look at the temporal resolution. It's not nearly as good as ERPs. Functional MRI allows you to get down to about the second level. Again, this is a little bit older, so this bubble should expand to about here. But still not nearly as good temporal resolution as ERPs. And you can see PET has similar uh, spatial resolution, but much worse temporal resolution. The bottom line is, is that each of these brain imaging techniques, really each technique that correlates brain behavior and function, has advantages and disadvantages. It has drawbacks, limitations. It's really only with converging evidence from multiple different techniques that we can confidently localize a cognitive function to a particular brain region. And I'm going to skip the example for now, but I should tell you also that I made this slide several years ago, and just in that time, things have changed a bit in the field. There's a, a trend toward no longer looking at the endeavor that we're on in this way where you're looking for which parts of the brain do what. It's starting to become clear that different parts of the brain do different things depending on the context, that different brain regions can sort of form dynamic networks with one another, such that the functions of the individual areas can change a bit depending on the context. So it gets a bit more complicated than just saying X brain region does Y.